generation to generation. Speaking of having fun among the generations, have you seen what's happening with the Cincinnati Reds lately? Come on, somebody. The Cincinnati Reds is the baseball team here. If you're not into baseball yet, uh, you might want to take a glance because they are tearing it up in first place. And yesterday, my brother-in-law sent me a picture of their new young player, Ellie de la Cruz. And the t-shirt was just actually this. It was a red shirt that just said, Ellie de la Cruz is a very fast man. <laughs> and if you didn't know this, yesterday he, 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 he had a flare single in the left field, and then he stole second, third, and, four, and home. There is no fourth. Home. In one at bat in the same inning, or one person's at bat. I'm telling you, FC Cincy's having fun, and they're doing great. Bengals football is coming again here in just a few, a few weeks. It's a good time to be a Cincy sports fan, and that's multi-generational <laughs> in Cincinnati. One Sunday, about 25 years ago, I was in prayer about the direction we were walking in as a church. I knew the Lord wanted something fresh among us. He wanted among us a church of tribes, nations, and peoples, a, a church that would be culturally rich, generationally rich, and linguistically rich, a church that was healing at the deepest fractures in the American society and in the human experience, and especially healing in the deep and the depth of the black-white fracture. I remember I was in prayer. At that time, we were sitting on the pulpit or on the platform still as pastors, and I was looking out over the congregation, and we were a lot of us looking like me, which is also precious. Come on, that's also precious. But uh, I saw this tall, stately uh, African-American man sitting right over here standing during worship, and I, I went off the platform uh, after, right after the service and went over to introduce myself. Because when there's only like three or four people of uh, darker, beautiful hues in the room, you pay attention to that as a pastor when the Lord is saying, I want a church that looks like and lives like and does life like heaven on earth. You pay attention. And I walked over to greet this man, and while I'm greeting him and just going, tell me about yourself, this woman, stately woman standing next to him, his mother, reaches out, puts her hand on my arm, she goes, I've been here six months and you've never come down and talked to me. <laughs> I was like, I like you. Who are you? She says, my name is Rose Sherman. She was in her early 80s. Mother Rose from that day on became a mentor in my life because I needed her in my life. Jan and I began to visit with her on Thursday mornings once a month, every month for several years at her apartment in Rose Lawn. While we were there, we would share about the burdens of our heart and what God was leading us in. She would share with me and us scripture and stories from her life. She would share from stories of her times in organizing in Oakland in the 60s and her times in, in the corporate world and as the first woman of color as a national officer for Girl Scouts of America. She shared about how she came to Jesus Christ, how she was filled with the Spirit, how the Lord called her to be a part of this church and why. And she would then pray over us. It was toast and tea with Tippy Rose. Her nickname was Tippy. One day, I remember as we were coming in through her entryway, I was admiring this framed picture on the wall, and it was a slave era water baptism. And she took it off the wall and she wrote a note on the back of it. She said, I want to make sure I'm giving this to you right now because someday when I'm gone, they may not know who I, I want to give this to. And I'm writing a note on it so I remember. And I'll give it to you before I lose my memory too much. A couple of years ago, she, or a couple of years after that, she did give that to me, and it hangs in my office now. But she wrote a note on the back of that, may the Lord honor and bless us in this vision of church like heaven. She was mentoring us cross-generationally, intentionally, cross-ethnically, cross-culturally for the kingdom generation to generation. Lord, would you teach us all that that can mean, from parents to children, from grandparents to grandchildren, from aunts and, and uncles to, to nieces and nephews, from friends to, to younger friends. Lord, all of us have a role to play in the richness of what you want to do in us as the body, both in discipleship and in matters of life and living your kingdom together. Lord, let this series richly lead us in that. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 
Paul writes to young Timothy, pastoring in Ephesus, he says, I'm reminded, Timothy, of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois. A sincere faith that lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded, now lives in you also. For this reason, Timothy, I'm, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. You've been given a gift in your heritage, Timothy. Fan it into flame. This gift which is in you and through the laying on of my hands too as a mentor in your life, Paul to Timothy. They weren't family. But Paul poured into his life. Paul, who, who, who lived life as a single man but mentoring up many spiritual daughters and sons. For the spirit that God gave us, Paul writes to Timothy, does not make us timid. In other words, this transformation, this transition from life to life, or that, not transition, but this transmission through mentorship from generation to generation, it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord. In other words, the things that I've shared with you from my life. And don't be ashamed about me, the things that I've done or that I'm a prisoner now for the gospel. Rather, join with me in suffering and risking your life too for the gospel by the power of God. Paul was letting Timothy know that you've been given strength and sustenance in your being from the generations that went before you. And that strength and that sustenance, it, it, it is for the fiber of your frame. And it's provided from the Lord to you, Timothy. Now, use it. Fan it into flame. Now, Exodus chapter 12 and the story of the children of Israel being brought out of captivity in Egypt. Exodus 12, verse 24, obey these instructions. Moses was teaching the children of Israel that there were some specific things that they could live by that would be life to them. And, and, and he says, obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. And he introduces the generation to generation principles of the kingdom. He says, when you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. I wonder if the Lord has promised you some things. There's some spiritual promises. There's, there's vision in your heart for things of the kingdom. Those two are, are for life to your children and your grandchildren. Just like that dedication service today. We're, we're transferring to our kids the richness of what we have as an inheritance in the Lord. And there are promises that He's given us, and we want our children to know these and to grow up into these. And so what the Lord did for the children of Israel is He gave them a ceremony to observe when it came to Passover. And when your children ask you about this ceremony, what does this mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when He struck down the Egyptians. Guess what? You two have a story to tell the next generation of how the Lord brought you out of captivity to sin and death and brought you into light and life. And that story is a spiritual history for all those who know you and love you. It's part of their history too, especially your children and grandchildren, or if you're, if you're single, your nieces and nephews, your friend circle, and the next generation in this church that you help serve because you serve and love them here. Then the people, when they heard the power of this passing things on to our next generation, they bowed down and worshipped. And they did what the Lord commanded. That's awesome. That's awesome to be intentional and do what the Lord gives us in, in, in giving uh, off to and out of our lives into the lives of the next generation, all that He's given to us. It's powerful and it takes intentionality. Pastor Arnold said last week as he launched this series, generational richness hinges on intentionality across the generations. It does not happen by accident. 
It takes making yourself available, hanging out, hanging out a little longer after services or getting here a little early and on time for the strength of everyone coming in or making yourself available in small groups when we have the next session of small groups. Why? Because when we do life together as the people of the kingdom, we learn to grow up in the kingdom together. I remember it was early 2004 and we had... Jan and I had just been in the role of senior leading the church at that point for just a few years. And uh, there had been careful prayer retreats and writing and sharing with leadership a vision that we would move towards being a church reflecting Revelation 7-9 of tribes and tongues and nations. And I remember how I was beginning to share it with the church in the spring of 2004, and, and the Lord had put specific wording on, on my heart and on the heart of the leadership, including the vision statement that God has called us to be a racially reconciling, generationally rich, life-giving church in the heart of Cincinnati. And I remember that was a, that was a big change. That was a, that was a change, a transition, a transformation happening inside of us as a body, as you were hearing me say a little bit earlier. But I also remember that there was something going on in my house at home, and that was this. We had decided to remodel our first floor. We had this 1960s home in Sharonville. We're raising our kids in the Princeton School District. And, and uh, we were in this nice, you know, four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath home. But the first floor had uh, rooms, small rooms, and little walkways between them. And you couldn't really use it to have a big group of people. And so Jan, who was fearless, and me, who was a scaredy cat, we decided we're going to remodel this thing. And I was petrified at, the, at what was going on in my house. All the walls had been knocked out, and they, were, they had beams holding different things up. And I, I go into the kitchen, and it's Easter Sunday. And I'm feeling stress within myself about the, the very important and hard call that God is calling us into as a church. To become a church, reflecting heaven on earth from having been what we were, which was a sliver of the church, of basically middle-class white commuters, and we're still precious and important to the work. <laughs> But we were now to be a church with everyone else included, and that would be a life-giving testimony in the city. And it was, a, it was like the whole first level of the church was torn up. It was like the home was a metaphor for what was going on in the church, and what was going on in the church was happening in my house. And I went over the, the sink to get some water as I was kind of processing all of this, and the water wouldn't turn on. Well, of course it wouldn't. We were remodeling the kitchen. And I remember, <laughs> my kids didn't care. They were having a ball. They were, you know, 10, 7, 5, I think were their ages at that time. Life was awesome. Jan was loving it because we were going to have what we eventually did have. And you know what the Lord did with that? As that house opened up, so did ministry in that house. And one of the things I remember is, is as our kids reached their teenage years, is the worshiping of the Lord as young people were coming over to study the Word and worship the Lord together. And we would be upstairs just listening and going, Lord, you remade the house and worship fills it today with the next generation. In the same way it was happening here in us. That spring, Pastor Brandon Wilkes came on staff and joined our team, a man of color who is also a Procter & Gamble trained and excellent executive pastor and served 10 years before they then left for St. Louis and now lead People's Church St. Louis. I remember that God was doing a work among us, that we were growing and learning and all of us stretching and realizing the kingdom is greater than just our own little part, our own little people, but that as a people together, we become a people of the Lord and the power and the presence of His his life in us like that. And so I realized that this is a story to tell because this is a story of spiritual heritage for us as a church, not just for my, my family, but also for my family. You see, stories show and share what Jesus is doing. So how do we do this? By the way, this next Sunday, we have a chance to really jump in with the family reunion Sunday that we do. We've, we did once during COVID, and we're doing a, a second time. I don't know if it's becoming a tradition. Well, I don't know. We'll see. But what time is church next Sunday? 1030. One service, and then party time, family reunion, food and fun in the Lord. It's going to be awesome. But we have to figure these things out in an intentional way 
in order to have life, leadership, and legacy in the church. So how do we do it? How do we do the intergenerational richness? I want to highlight what I've already been doing and saying, and that is tell spiritual stories. Stories have life. Stories are testimony. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony. Stories. Be vulnerable in your storytelling about your fears and your hopes. As you're sharing with the next generation, and that's my focus today is from older to younger, and in two Sundays from now, I will be sharing about from younger to older, the, the mentoring up that we can be doing. That it, it, it enlivens and strengthens the, the richness of generations in a church. Next Sunday, Pastor Harrison will be bringing his story on next Sunday in that one service. It's going to be incredible. Doing life all in as one church, all of us together. But the vulnerability is key because in the vulnerability we realize, and younger people realize, that the fears that they have or sometimes the failures that they're experiencing, they're not alone in those. That's not just happening to them. That has happened to us. But God has brought us through. And that's the testimony that God has brought us through. And we don't have to act like we're perfect. Be honest with who we are. And that brings me to the second one, which is this. Live integrously. So I'm, I want to mention just these six thoughts that the Lord has been laying on my heart and they've been percolating from telling the stories, the life stories, to the power of living with integrity and honor as the Lord helps us. Now this doesn't mean perfect living. In fact, what it means is honest living about the imperfections. But at the same time, not allowing ourselves to have dual lives or living a double-minded life where we have one thing that we say is our testimony in Christ, but another way that we live in secret and do things that, yes, guess what? Our kids know. And younger people can tell. And the life is bled from the strength of the family as the Lord would have it. But here's the thing. We're not going to be perfect. So the call isn't to be perfect, it's to be honest when we've moved off of what our vision is. Being honest where our mistakes have taken place. And, and sharing about God's grace in the midst of that, even as we live vulnerably. Because when we are honest about our failures, we're not telling anybody anything they don't already know. When we don't tell them, then they realize we think they don't know that we have a dual life. Does that make sense to anybody? And one of the number one things that, that, that kids will struggle with in order to have within them what they need to follow the Lord is if mom and dad say one thing with their mouth and do another thing with their life. In their marriage or in their spiritual life, their church life, their ministry life, or their vocational life. It doesn't matter. So I would encourage us for the generational richness that the Lord has for us. With his help, walk life in a congruent way between your testimony and your living, if that makes sense. Thirdly, live sacrificially and not selfishly. This may be the hardest one because it is the human condition to want to take care of myself first. But it is not the way of the kingdom. The way of the kingdom is to lay down one's life not only for our friends, but also for our enemies. That is love. And when we live sacrificially within our family or within the church family, when we live, not, uh, when we live unselfishly, we, we basically live out and show out what it is to follow Jesus Christ in a way that is consistent, in a way that is consistent with His character. And therein, we also model the methods of the kingdom, which are at a cost to myself, I want to lift others. At a cost to myself, I want to pour out. At a cost to myself, because of what he's done in my life, I want to give back. Living sacrificially. And then fourth, we, we really bring about a richness cross-generationally when we as older ones listen carefully to the matters of the heart from the younger ones. If they open their heart to share with us a dream, 
we celebrate that with them. If they open their heart to share a fear, we join them in that and show our own vulnerability in that space, in our own life. In that, we are helping them identify with one whose life is ahead of them and who's making it, and they realize, I too can make it. Or when they share a dream and we celebrate that with them, it's the Father's heart that they, they, they feel like right from heaven to them through you, from mom or dad, from grandfather or grandmother, from aunt or uncle. As you, as we, for the next generation, as they are sharing with us, which means we've got to have time together, it helps when we do that in life group, it helps when we do that in the after party right here on the Sunday gatherings. It helps when we hang out at some of the special events like the family reunion next Sunday and we we actually are available. Availability is critical in order to have matters of the heart shared between generations. And then when we hear those, encourage specifically. Encourage specifically. I know for me this is a challenge because my mind races ahead when somebody starts sharing something with me. My mind goes quickly to what I think they're going to be sharing, and I start talking about it already. And they're like, um, I had something to tell you. Now, Jan's being very kind over there and didn't say amen real loud. Neither did (laughs) or my kids (laughs) or anybody that works with me on the team. (laughs) But that's something I'm working on. Because listening carefully to the matters of the heart and encouraged specifically requires that you hear what's said. Fifth, be generous with heart-level affirmations. Heart-level affirmations. Using words, not just, not just like it on a text. I know that's nice. We need to be able to communicate and let people know we, we heard them or we got the message. But when I'm What I'm talking about is when we're in person together, or even in writing, it can be in a text, saying something that costs us. An affirmation that has investment with it can help grow trees of righteousness. So being generous with heart-level affirmation, especially with your children, especially with younger people, and with your own children, include affection. Not just words of affirmation, but gathering them up in your arms, celebrating them, hugging them, kissing them. This can last into adulthood. you got to be careful how you do it, but you know. This is important. It's important that our, our children and our nieces and nephews feel appropriate, healthy affection for their value to us. Sixth, laugh easily and especially at yourself. There's nothing like when we can laugh at ourselves to disarm everyone else. When we're defensive, everyone gets defensive. When we can laugh at ourselves, and this isn't easy, this isn't easy for me, we get embarrassed, right? Or we get into competition or we get into comparing. But when we can laugh easily, intergenerationally, it breaks down the tension so fast. The other thing about laughing from the heart about things that happen that are fun and funny is that we are vulnerable emotionally. Emotional vulnerability is key for connecting between people, and especially so between the generations. And I love that about you guys. You are a church that knows how to laugh. You know how to love. You know how to celebrate each other. You know how to do the richness What we're sharing in this series is simply strengthening so that everything that goes on in the life of this 117-year-old healthy church for decade after decade, thank you, Jesus. We don't take that for granted. We thank you, God, for the leaders that have gone before us that have helped cultivate these things. But we, we, we talk about this in this series because this is the stuff. This is like the mortar between the living stones. There are some key biblical models if you want to look at and take a couple of hours to study these stories and read more about them. But just a few from the, the New Testament. Uh, I think it's, it's an amazing thing to think about how Elizabeth poured into Mary 
Elizabeth was the mother of John the Baptist and cousin or aunt to, to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary went and spent weeks and weeks with her aunt, and deep things of God were placed into her life. We've already read about Lois and, and Eunice to Timothy. Isn't it interesting that his father wasn't mentioned? Maybe they were single mom, single grandma. I don't know. We don't know. The biblical record doesn't say. We know that Paul was not kin to Timothy, but Paul took him under wing and poured into his life as a son, a spiritual son. And Paul was a single man. Joseph and Mary, we often think about how they poured into Jesus, but you know they, had to, they also had to pour into people like James, their other kids were important to them too. Why do I bring up James and, and what, what happened in his life is because he became such a, a pillar leader in the early church. James is the leader who helps convene and lead the decision of the, of the uh, Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15 that allows room for all the rest of us to be included. Not just the Jewish believers in Jesus, but all of the Gentile believers in Jesus. James has the depth and the strength to lead that massive decision to fulfill the will of the Lord. It wasn't Peter. Peter was part of it. It's James who brings the decision forward. How did he have such strength in his frame? Maybe, just maybe, it was all that his parents, Joseph and Mary, had poured into him. The power of our pouring in when they're young to what their life will produce as they are older. Wow. Lord, give us a vision for this, for our children, for our grandchildren, for our nieces and nephews, and for the children of this church, all of us, single or married, serving and loving the kids and youth of this church. In the Old Testament, you have the story of Naomi and Ruth. Naomi, a widow and Jewish, and Ruth, who becomes widowed as well, and a Moabitess, an outcast people group, not, not welcome even in the worship or the assembly of the children of Israel. And yet, Naomi pours into her and Ruth mentors up and that relationship richly becomes one of the relationships, one of the ancestor relationships for Jesus himself, Ruth, a great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. Samuel to David. Samuel wasn't kin to David, but Samuel was there for him, not only anointing him when the Lord pointed out this is the one, but also being available to David for counsel all the days of Samuel's life. I think of Bathsheba to Solomon. She could have decided my life is a, is a wreck, but she gathers herself and she pours into her son Solomon, who then grows to be the wisest of all kings probably in human history. Or Mordecai to Esther. Mordecai adopting her and, and, and pouring his life into her. And then Esther, she becomes so high level in the kingdom that literally she influences the salvation of her people when they were going to be decimated. A holocaust that would have taken place long before the holocaust. But Esther, chosen for such a time as this. But how was she prepared for that? Mordecai pouring into her life. Healthy generational richness from older to younger is a bedrock strength of the church. And we can all give ourselves to this. We might see ourselves as young, but there's always a generation right behind that we can, we can bless, we can affirm, we can story tell with, we can give our lives to, we can serve them in the local church. We, we have something to give. And then in two weeks, I'll talk more about the younger to the older because it is just as powerful in what God is doing in his church. Concluding with Psalm 145, verses 4 and 5 and 6. One generation commends your works, O Lord, to another. We commend his works. We talk about what he's done. We say what he's done. I want to give you an example from this morning's first service. I, I, was, I was leaving out this direction after the, the first service and stopped to pray with someone who, who was in tears. And 
I noticed she was holding a business card from the University of Cincinnati, and I recognized the name on the card. And I said, oh, you met so-and-so. And she said, yeah. I was in prayer because this week I was diagnosed with cancer. And I was just crying out to the Lord and, and crying. And this person from another part of the room came and, and wrapped her arms around me from behind and hugged me and then prayed for me. And then I told her what I'd learned this week, just this week. And she takes out her business card and hands it to me. And, and I knew who it was. And she said, she's an administrator at UC Medical School, a College of Medicine. I was like, yeah, isn't that kind of cool that the Lord connects? She goes, that happens to me every time I'm here. The Lord's like connecting dots, connecting people. And then uh, Deb Patterson and I, these are two newer people in the church and had not known each other before this morning. And then Deb, who's been in the church for decades, and I anointed uh, Nancy with, with oil to pray for he, her healing, but also to thank God for connecting her to Kristen. Right there, I just told you a God story. <laughs> that happened here With, within just two hours, three hours ago right over there by those windows because the Spirit of God is in His church and the Spirit of God is at work and when, we, when we're paying attention we, we see it paying attention to it in our own lives but also in the life of the church and in each other's lives and then sharing and telling what God has done this is Psalm 145, verse 4. One generation commends your works to another. And as the children, as you hear these stories today, young people, it's part of your story. It's part of your spiritual heritage. And these are stories, and you will have stories to tell. You will speak of the glorious splendor of the Lord's majesty. And the next generation will meditate on His wonderful works. The psalmist is saying, I meditate on the things that I'm hearing and my life is changed. The, 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 the generations, they tell of the power of your awesome works. And I too will proclaim your great deeds. Lord, we want to be like that. We want to be like the, the older generation who's investing and then sharing the stories of good news, of amazing things. But we also want to be like the younger generation receiving, meditating on these things, and our frame is strengthened. And then, also, joining in to tell of your power and your awesome work. So Lord, I pray over your church. I pray over every family, the richness of spiritual storytelling. I pray over this family as a body of believers the richness of spiritual storytelling that our frame would be strengthened in you and the next generations that we don't even know yet will come to rejoice. And everyone said,